Hello, everyone. Very welcome to DBS webinar. Today, we are very privileged to have two speakers from the International Energy Agency, Michael Waldron and Lucila Abelea, with us. We really want to make use of the next hour to really bring to your doorstep at your company level what it means to finance clean energy transition. I've been instructed by the IEA that it is important to highlight that there is more than one path to do transition. Hence the title of the webinar, you would note, you would see that is clean energy transitions uh, in plural. There is more than one path to pivot your company and we want to go beyond the theoretical. So during the course of the webinar, you are welcome to enter your questions through the Pigeonhole app. The QR code should be shown here. So let me pass on to um, the head of energy, renewable and infrastructure, Weezing Lim, to do the opening before passing on to IEA. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and to all our guests, esteemed clients, business leaders, and also our colleagues from IEA, Michael and Lucilla, who will be speaking to us, and of course, our very own DBS colleagues. I was just glancing through the client list, the attendee list, and we have a good spread of attendees from Europe to Asia, ranging from power gen codes, power equipment and solution providers to global traders, infrastructure funds, asset managers and energy commodity players. So welcome to all of you. Welcome to our DBS Business Insights on the topic of financing clean energy transitions. Today's webinar with IEA is the first in a series of knowledge sharing sessions that we have put together for our clients and colleagues. More than just a financing partner to our clients, we want to also be your knowledge partner as you embark on your transition journey from a phrase I will borrow from a client, Sam Corp, as you go from brown to green. We're happy to lend you money, but we also want to strengthen industry engagement, catalyze ideas, and co-ideate co-create solutions as we all journey through these very exciting times. Some of you may know this week is Energy Week in Singapore. Lots of news flow around regional imports of renewable energy, ASEAN power grids, green hydrogen, CCUS. And we're also days away from COP26 in Glasgow and serving as a rather apt backdrop. Uh, we are facing surging gas, coal and oil prices. Apologies. While the why of clean energy is quite universally agreed, the how to transit to that clean landscape is really the four to six trillion dollar question, depending on which consultant you ask. And that's why we have brought our colleagues from the IEA to share with us today. Asia is particularly in a conundrum. While growth trajectories are one of the most promising, energy is a critical input to realize that growth. Go or no go decisions around long-term investments in, in energy infrastructure have become more complex. Client conversations I've had around green energy, green minerals, green commodities, carbon offsets, smart energy solutions, they have increased tremendously in the past 18 months. And that's where we aspire to play a part in our client's transition journey, advising, ideating, structuring optimal capital solutions for you across the entire capital structure, equity, mezzanine, sub and senior debt, across capital markets, as well as bank markets. And of course, we usually put our money where our mouth is by financing these very solutions that we advise. Tangibly, DBS launched the world's first sustainable and transition finance framework and taxonomy in 2020. And we were also the first Singapore bank to offer transition financing to companies willing to take incremental steps toward reducing their carbon footprint. This framework pinpoints incremental solutions for companies in fossil fuel reliant industries to tap into sustainable finance markets. And our efforts don't stop at financing but include catalyzing decarbonization solutions at scale, as evidenced by our recent setup jointly of CIX, 
a global voluntary carbon marketplace and exchange. Because at DBS, we are convinced about the opportunities arising from the two mega trends we all see, digitalization and sustainability. And increasingly, we're seeing these two trends actually merge and reinforce each other. With that, I would like to really introduce again how happy we are to have our two speakers from the IEA, Michael and Lucilla. And Michael's work focuses on assessing the implications of investment and financing trends for meeting energy security and sustainability goals. He was previously the project manager and a lead author of the IEA's medium-term renewable energy market report. Lucilla covers the clean power investments, financing costs of renewables and policies to attract capital for the clean energy transition in emerging and developing countries. Together, they will take us through the report and there will be a Q&A, as we said, at the end of, our, of the presentation. Please do questions that you have via the pigeonhole. Thank you very much, and I'll hand the time now to Michael. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for the opportunity to, to have this discussion uh, with you and, and your stakeholders today. I'm going to give a few opening remarks, uh, hand it over to Lucilla to kick off the presentation, and then I'll uh, wrap up uh, with the second half. Um, but first, just a bit of introduction on this report, which was published in early June. This Financing Clean Energy Transitions report builds on the work that we've done for several years now as part of the World Energy Investment Series, our annual tracking of capital expenditures across the energy sector. Um, and in many ways, it reflects all the efforts done um, to try to quantify those investments and then to assess what they mean uh, for transition goals in emerging and developing economies. The report was launched very closely in succession with the IA's Net Zero Emissions Roadmap by 2050, uh, which came out in late May. And in that light, this is giving you a bit of an insight as to the emerging and developing economy story around net zero. And it recognizes that achieving global climate goals requires all countries to meet those goals. So as our executive director has said, uh, no one wins the race to net zero unless we all win the race. Um, but we also recognize that there are unique economic and financial challenges to clean energy transitions in this part of the world. These have been exacerbated by the pandemic, and that's one of the big reasons why we undertook uh, this piece of analysis. Uh, so with that backdrop, I'll turn it over to Lucilla to kick off and discuss some of the main findings. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for the invitation. Great to be here. Maybe if we can move to the first slide so to provide a little bit of background. Uh, so one of the main reasons why we did this report and why we focus on these uh, countries, and just to clarify, I'll be speaking about emerging and developing economies and what we mean by this is the entire world except advanced economies and except China. And, and, and the main reason for focusing on this is because we believe that the world's energy and climate future increasingly hinges on the decisions made in these uh, geographies. And I think that we'll be seeing a lot of that in uh, the COP discussions, for example. And just for a bit of background, kind of like to put in context, these economies account for two thirds of the global world population. That's what you will see. That's a yellow that you see on top of the purple. In 2021, they are set to account for only around a third of the energy investment, the global energy investment. That's again, the, the yellow that you'll see in the second bubble. In terms of investments and how they Trended uh, over the years, we see that annual energy investments in emerging and developing economies have fallen by around a fifth since 2016. This is mainly due to a reduction from uh, lower spending in oil and gas supply, predominantly in major hydrocarbon rich countries, but uh, spending has um, fallen across all regions and there are still persistent challenges in mobilizing finance for clean energy projects um, and therefore there's no compensation uh, from that side of the investment um, given the fall in oil and gas supply. Plus, and this is the third point of this slide, uh, emerging and developing economies account for only one fifth of the investment in clean energy. And that's what you see this sort of small yellow in, on top of the green. Emerging and developing economies have a vast potential for economic and energy demand. It was mentioned before, um, we see a lot of expected growth, projected growth, industrialization, a lot of people moving uh, to cities, so a lot of urbanization and a lot of welfare hopefully coming with that. 
But uh, the main issue and maybe a takeaway of this slide is that there is a, a major gap between future needs and today's energy investment flows. Now, moving on what this means in terms of emissions, and that's what we see in the next slide. Development pathway in place right now for these economies points to higher emissions ahead. Exception, but otherwise on average, it's around a quarter. But yet they are, they are set to account for the bulk of the uh, CO2 emissions growth in the coming decades. So in a scenario, uh, Reflecting today's stated policies in IEA steps scenario, emissions are projected to fall by around two gigatons in advanced economies and to plateau in China. So that's what you see in the purple line, that's advanced economies, and the, and the red one is China. By contrast, emissions uh, from emerging and developing economies are projected to grow. This is over the next two decades to 2040, uh, and it's a bit, um, the trend continues uh, to 2050 in a similar manner. So the challenge, again, is to find development models that meet the aspirations of their citizens, citizens that, as I said, uh, will hopefully improve their livelihoods while avoiding sort of high carbon choices. Now, um, when we move to um, clean energy investments uh, in particular, we observe that they, uh, they have been stuck. And that's what you see in this next slide, or basically, from 2016 to 2020, the level of clean energy investment hasn't um, really moved. They declined by around 8% to less than 150 billion in 2020, according to our, our numbers. This is capital spending, uh, with only a slight rebound expected in 2021. Now, when we compare these uh, levels to what um, the average annual investments would need to be. Uh, in the second half of 2020, this is the average between 2026 and 2030 uh, projected investment under a net zero emission scenario, very ambitious scenario. Um, we see that these economies need to expand by more than seven times to above one trillion. That's what you see on the um, column on the right. This is again in order to put the world on track to reach net zero emissions by 2050, the corresponding investments by the second half of 2020. This means a massive scale up in clean power, of course, solar and wind are the, the best examples, but also hydro, geothermal in some parts of Southeast Asia, for example, and that's the dark blue that you see on the right column. But also a lot more spending in terms of managing and electrifying demand spending in energy efficiency in buildings and industry, cooling appliances. This is particularly important with the big uptake in Southeast Asia and other parts of Asia, sales of uh, electric vehicles, as well as the infrastructure that uh, is required, and decarbonization of heavy industry, for example. And we'll be talking a bit more about that. Also, in terms of share of investments, clean energy investments will need to move from around um, uh, a quarter today to around two-thirds uh, in, in the next decade. And that was the red dot in the previous slide. But staying in this slide now, and basically staying on this point by look, but looking a little bit more on the implications by sector and by region, that's what you see in this slide, uh, we see that the acceleration in investment uh, or an acceleration in all regions to support clean energy transitions needs to come with a major reallocation of capital across sectors. So we not only need an increased level of investment, but also reallocation of how that capital goes to different sectors across the energy value change. Uh, over the past five years, fuel supply has accounted for well over half of the energy investment in these economies, with higher shares in Middle East, North Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And overall, spending on fuel supply over the next decade, when um, looking at climate um, sustainable scenarios like the NZE, we still see a, 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 a level of investment that is similar to what we've seen in the past, but two points to highlight. One is that we see an increasing share uh, that needs to be destined to low emission fuels, especially in a net zero emission scenario, and the fact that spending in fuel supply starts to account for a much smaller share of the total investment. And this is because the majority of the future investments should be allocated towards power and use efficiency and low emission fuels, as I said um, in my previous slide. And in fact, we see that some of the largest gaps 
in this um, comparing today's to, to, to the future investment needs are in India, Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa within our sort of group of emerging and developing economies. Now, um, sort of, if we move to the next slides, we look at how decarbonizing implies capitalizing. And what we see in this graph is the historical and future electricity supply costs in an IA climate-driven scenario. We see that in 2010, 2020, and 2030, how this will move. And here, there are two main messages. One is that a greater share goes towards capital in the form of increased investment and capital recovery for renewables and grids, in particular, uh, that, that, that are sort of the green parts that you see on the graphs. And second, that the picture reflects the evolving cost structure of the energy system, in which affordability depends more and more on financing costs. We observe that as the world, but as emerging and developing economies invest more in clean energy, the energy system becomes more capital intensive, where financing costs become more important in the overall cost of the transition. And, and this is also why at the IEA we've been focusing a lot more on trying to understand the cost of capital and, and the differences in the cost of capital between um, different regions of the world. Why, why is this sort of shift towards um, um, a higher relevance of financing costs is because many of the needed assets in this move to in this decarbonization or move towards more electrification have higher upfront costs and higher capex to opex uh, ratios for example now depending more on financing costs is particularly challenging in geographies in countries where capital has been traditionally constrained where financial markets are less developed where capital markets are less developed like is the case uh, in most emerging and developing economies. Now, um, a shift and, and moving to the next slide, uh, and maybe a bit of a more positive note, at least to start in the slide, a shift to more electricity investment also means a shift to technologies with deflationary costs, at least until now, but if we look at the last 10 years, where falling costs uh, have meant that demand can be made more affordably than ever. And what you see in this slide is a um, what we looked at was on the left is the investment in solar PV and onshore wind capital investment uh, in three moments of the last decade, and then the output associated with that investment from this new capacity. And what we see is that a dollar spent on wind and solar PV deployment today results in a third more electricity than a dollar spent on the same technologies 10 years ago. So that's good. It means that we're getting more power for the same dollar. Yet, cost reductions are not as powerful in these parts of the world as globally. We did the same uh, analysis in the World Energy Investment Report also at the beginning of this year at a global level. And we find that um, when we look at sort of at the world level, we see that it's actually four times more electricity per dollar spent on the same technologies 10 years ago. Pointing to the fact that there's still a lot of potential uh, in the in emerging and developing economies to sort of take advantage of, of of the many of the progress, particularly in these two technologies. And now to to close this slide, sort of reducing that or, or gaining uh, being able to take advantage of uh, the progress of these technologies by addressing some of the key issues that affect the investment case. And and mm -hmm. and here I'll sort of mention three important points. One is the presence of long and also ambitious strategies. And again, we'll probably be discussing this a lot in, in places like COP, but also competitive procurement plans so that investors and financiers are able to visualize credible pipeline of projects. Sometimes when talking with investors, they tell us it's not about having an absolute perfect policy and regulatory framework, but at least one that is very clear so that we can price risks uh, accordingly. Second, the availability of bankable contracts. Um, and, and how in these contracts, um, how they manage risk and particularly payment risks to facilitate low cost debt and the participation of uh, wider pools of lenders. And, and I'm sure I know that this is the case, for example, in Southeast Asia, where off takers are generally uh, state owned entities that sometimes are not, um, are not in the best financial standing, and this is a big issue. And third, the access to land and enabling infrastructure, which can um, hold back projects, as well as everything around it, like permitting process, processes and, and things of the kind, which we see 
are an issue and particularly in, in places with geographies like uh, that in Southeast Asia. And with that, I'll pass it back to Mike, who will be speaking about the end use side as well as many other points. Thank you very much, uh, Lucilla. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so when looking at clean energy transitions, um, of course, we have a very big focus on the demand side and understanding how this proceeds uh, along the different aspects of that in buildings, industry, and transport. One of the themes that we see in emerging and developing economies is that many of these economies are rapidly urbanizing, industrializing, and I would also add electrifying to the title. Um, this is uh, shown, first of all, by looking at the slide, looking at the, um, at the graph on the left. It simply shows you the increased demand for mobility that we see in the sustainable development scenario. Increasingly, a larger share of these vehicles by 2030 would need to be electric. So in climate-driven scenarios, one out of every seven passenger cars sold in EMDEs would need to be an electric vehicle. Um, this, of course, would need to be higher to meet net zero emissions goals. If you click again on the next uh, two charts, actually, just to show the next two charts. Um, this increased demand for mobility is also done in conjunction with an increased demand for, for household cooling and, and comfort. Um, in terms of space cooling, um, we looked at the ownership of air conditioners and we find that these increased strongly uh, over the projection period. We also find that to meet all the demand for building cities, for, for um, industrial materials, for building materials, et cetera, um, this results in an increase, a strong increase in industrial production across the emerging and developing economies. And so the important thing is to make sure that all of this new demand um, is being delivered efficiently and, and cleanly um, to the system. And in many ways, this can be done using existing measures uh, such as energy efficiency or electrification, but in some sectors such as industry or heavy industry, uh, the solutions uh, require more in the way of innovation and technology development, as well as the development of some of the first-of-a-kind projects um, to bring new technologies such as low-emissions fuels to the market. Um, if you could click uh, three times, um, I'll just highlight some of the issues for investment that we see in attracting finance in the end use sectors. And of course, these are very broad, but we can get down into more details in the Q&A if, if, if desired. Um, one is the fact that a lot of these investments are carried out by consumers or small and medium-sized enterprises whose primary business is not energy. Their primary business is, is something else. And so they already have challenges in accessing low-cost financing in emerging and developing economies. Um, and they may not see the business case for investing in an energy upgrade or more efficient use of energy, um, and it may not be apparent to them. Um, another issue is the policy background. And so we, we see as a clear factor for success for efficiency is to have the presence of clear uh, performance standards um, also integrated into building codes, and for these to be mandated and enforced over time. Um, with systems um, such as labeling that help uh, users and, and investors to identify more efficient choices. And then the last is measures that help to monetize energy savings as well as encourage the uptake of new fuels. Uh, in particular, a number of financial actors have challenges sort of assessing the business case for efficiency. Um, and there's a number of financing and, and business model considerations that can help to improve this. Uh, next slide, please. Now, aside from looking um, not just at the issues related to, to clean electricity and some of the issues that are a bit more uh, electrification focused, we had an entire chapter devoted to financing transactions in the fuel supply um, companies and emission, emissions intensive sectors. And what we did is we did a bit of a deep dive in trying to understand what are the implications uh, for producer economies in different emerging and developing regions uh, from the shift away from oil, gas, and coal and towards cleaner sources. Um, so this picture right here basically shows you historical net income, how it's derived for a number of regions. Of course, the Middle East and Eurasia figure very prominently in this picture. If you could click forward once. And, but when we're looking at what happens under climate-driven scenarios, um, so a rapid move towards clean energy, more efficient use of demand, um, we see that the revenue implications or the income implications are quite stark. And so there's a, when you're looking at the difference between IEA scenarios, so looking between today's policy settings um, and the much more ambitious net zero emissions by, by 2050 scenario, there's some $10 trillion difference in the value of the, pres the present value of, of oil and gas income uh, under those two scenarios. So it gives you a, a sense 
of where the delta is and where some of the uncertainty is for these producer economies. Of course, there are benefits that accrue notably to net importers, and this is shown by the three regions on the top, India, Southeast Asia, as well as other Asian economies um, who are able to improve their, their position. Now, this points to some of the strategies that would be necessary for producer economies to be able to, to undertake this transition. Um, some of these strategies are, are economic in terms of diversification, but in terms of diversification of the energy system, um, it really has to deal with um, focusing on technology development, reducing environmental footprints from existing oil and gas uh, operations, uh, trying to capture additional value in complex energy supply chains. Um, this also includes the uptake of, of low emissions fuels, um, but also other um, renewable sources to help green um, their supply. Also paying attention to the issues related to, um, to downstream emissions and scope three emissions, so how the, the products from these companies are used um, in the rest of the economy. Next slide, please. And so with this report, we've given a lot of kind of um, outlook in terms of you know the types of changes which would be needed in the investments and also in terms of the energy system. Um, we've also looked in depth at how these changes could be financed uh, going forward and so we we've tracked and we've tried to project the sources of finance across a number of different parameters for energy investments and what this chart shows you right here is two of those parameters. It shows you the split between uh, public and private finance and it shows you the split between debt and equity uh, that would help to finance the investments that we see. Um, this is in the past. If you click forward once, it shows you how this evolves in the future uh, under a climate-driven scenario. So the role of the private sector increases as well as the role of debt. But if you just isolate those investments which are focused on clean energy, so clean energy being um, clean power uh, generation, being energy efficiency and end use, and also being low emissions fuels, um, you can see that the contribution from the private sector is, is much higher. So the private sector would need to account for about 70% of the financing of these investments by 2030. Um, of course, the public sector still plays a very important role in energy investments overall. Notably, state-owned enterprises play a very important role in terms of funding and building out um, electricity grids and networks, which are key, which are the backbone for, for clean energy transitions. And public finance institutions also play a very important catalytic role. And we had quite a few messages on the role that public finance can play in the transition. Um, and this is through providing blended finance that helps to de-risk projects which are need to scale up in new markets with relatively high risks or in new technologies um, which need to be demonstrated or, or basically push down the learning curve. Um, and so even though it comprises a minority of the finance that's um, on offer by 2030, um, we still see a very important role, a very increasing role uh, for both domestic and international public finance institutions in helping to catalyze some of this investment. On the instrument side, as I mentioned before, um, overall energy investments shift to a greater reliance on debt. Um, this relax, reflects the, the increased capital intensity of the energy sector um, and, and specifically of the power sector that, that Lucilla showed in a slide earlier and the availability to tap into long-term lower cost debt is particularly important for, for financing these investments going forward. When we just look at the, sh the share of clean energy investments, it's even more apparent of the need for low cost debt. Um, but of course, equity still remains very important and equity remains important um, to fund some of these uh, newer technologies and also to fund areas um, which still have a number of risks or need a bit of a push um, to get going. This, this is particularly true in areas like fin financing industrial decarbonization, um, where there are less commercial solutions right now on the, on the table. The next slide, please. Now, the good news for all of this is that on a global basis, and I'm sure you're all well aware or attuned to this, is that um, finance, sustainable finance is, is plentiful and, and well available. Um, we've seen a, a dramatic ramp up in sustainable finance, in sustainable debt issuance, um, occur over the past five years. We've seen record levels already in the first half of 2021, even extending this out to the, to the latest data. It appears that sustainable debt, I think, is close to $1 trillion of issuance um, this year, which is which is eclipsing that from, from 2020. But as is apparent from the chart, um, the vast majority of this has been concentrated in advanced economies. We have seen issuance, good issuance in, in China over time, and also in some emerging and developing economies. Uh, such as in India and in, in, in Latin America. 
Southeast Asia has accounted for less than 5% of this overall issuance. And we also see, despite this dramatic growth in sustainable debt issuance, we haven't seen the same level of growth or the same rate of growth in clean energy capital expenditures. So we're seeing more finance, more investor interest in clean energy, um, but this is not exactly translated into a ramp up of clean energy investments on the ground, even though clean energy investments at a global level have been increasing somewhat over the past three years. Um, one of the messages we've given in the financing report is that both developers and financiers need to uh, increase their allocation of capital to two underserved asset classes. One of those is clean energy in particular. The other is emerging and developing economies more broadly. Um, this depends on the adequate investment signals being put in place, but it also depends on the evolution of some of the sustainable finance frameworks. Um, so right now, with very good, attention, good intentions, sustainable finance frameworks uh, are trying to target um, alignment with net zero emissions portfolios, um, but this oftentimes has the unintended consequence of perhaps excluding financing opportunities or capital from those um, industries or countries with more challenging um, emissions transition paths or those who are starting at, at a lower level of, uh, of progress compared to in advanced economies or in some of the low-hanging fruit that we see um, with, with companies who are able to raise money quite easily in terms of sustainable finance. Uh, next slide, please. So despite all this backdrop of you know, ample finance being available and the needs, uh, we still do see a, a dichotomy in terms of the cost of capital around the world. Um, we've looked at this chart basically just shows you the, the kind of base rates. So before you even get to the energy sector and the risks inherent in some of the energy projects, what's the starting point for the cost of capital um, that investors in, in projects may face in, in various economies? If you could click again. And what we found is that, you know, one of the main messages from the report is that this cost of capital can be up to seven times higher in emerging and developing economies than in the United States or Europe, for example. Um, of course, this could also be much higher if you're talking about more risky economies or if you're talking about segments such as consumer segments or SMEs, um, where the cost of finance is it's naturally higher. Um, over 90% of the clean energy investments that would need to occur um, in the in climate-driven scenarios in emerging and developing economies would, would happen in economies where financial systems are relatively underdeveloped, and so they have a challenging time uh, attracting capital to begin with. Um, so putting all this together, it means that domestic actors and the international financial community would need to work even harder on the energy policy reforms in the issues to help make energy projects more attractive um, and address this gap. And so if we could go to the final slide now. And what we did in the report um, is give a number of priority actions to help um, address this cost of capital gap, but also some of the challenges that we've noted um, throughout this presentation. Um, we did a detailed analysis of successful projects and initiatives uh, highlighted by around 50 real world case studies across clean power efficiency and electrification, as well as transitions for fuels and emissions intensive sectors. These ranged from countries such as Brazil to Indonesia and from Senegal to, to Bangladesh. So covering the spectrum of different types of energy situations, but also economic situations. Now, the first category of these recommendations recommends recognizing that recognizes that an international catalyst would be needed to boost clean energy investments in emerging and developing economies. Um, this starts with the commitment by advanced economies to mobilize the $100 billion per year in climate finance, um, but this is just a first order condition and this is not enough um, to meet climate goals in the longer term. Um, one of the main messages that we gave around this notion of redoubling international support is that the capabilities, the funding levels, the strategies of international financial institutions would need to be boosted um, and be oriented around a clear and unified focus on financing emissions reductions in clean energy, particularly in the developing world. Um, this has to do with reinforcing the mandate for development finance institutions, but also measures to help boost and improve the delivery of climate finance, as well as enhance the deployment of blended finance to help mobilize additional private capital. At the same time, and if you could click uh, three times, I believe, and we'll just let the, uh, the different call out boxes come up. Uh, we identified a number of other measures um, for both international and domestic actors to focus on um, 
some of these measures related to finance and clean energy transitions is about tackling some of the cross-cutting issues. And so this can have to do with um, addressing fossil fuel subsidies, which create an imbalance, a playing field between clean energy and fossil fuels. It could have to do with um, ensuring the financial stability of state-owned actors and state-owned utilities, which are very important in terms of network infrastructure, but also in the transactions for, for renewable power, for example. Uh, it can have to do with putting in place some measures to improve licensing, permitting, and reduce the administrative procedures associated with clean energy projects. And it also includes a number of different sectoral considerations. Some of those sectoral considerations we highlighted uh, earlier in the report, uh, so I won't repeat them now, but perhaps we can take this up in the, in the Q&A. Um, all in all, one of the things that we highlight is the tremendous opportunity associated with financing clean energy transitions. Um, we've had analysis in our World Energy Outlook, which talks about some of the employment implications um, from increasing clean energy investment in related activities. Um, but there's also a dramatic market size which is available. And another piece of analysis we had in the World Energy Outlook this year showed the evolution of clean tech markets um, over the next 30 years and where this is found in the world. And it's really the Asia Pacific region, uh, which accounts for about 45% of this um, by 2050. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over to, to the hosts and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Lucilla. That's a lot of information for us to digest. I can see that in Pigeonhole, um, there are quite a number of questions in there already. Uh, if you have any questions during the course of the presentation that you want to put in now, please do so. Um, scan the QR code with your mobile phone. So in the meantime, uh, waiting for um, more questions to come in, I definitely agree with uh, some of the concluding remarks about the cost of capital. We know that financing any projects, not just clean energy projects, uh, in emerging and developing economies tends to be a lot higher. Uh, but I would say that uh, nowadays, um, for uh, the right reasons, the ESG investment, the cost, the, the capital going into green investment has been abundant. And with that, not only the cost of capital has come down, but also the WAC, the weighted average um, uh, uh, cost of capital has also come down to allow people to borrow more debt. So I think uh, on this, with we seeing our host today who has been in project finance for decades, would definitely be able to comment on it. Um, we at DBS are very firm in our belief that private finance needs to be directed towards clean energy investments to support our customers' capacity. I think uh, we could start the Q&A and showing the pigeonhole questions. You can also vote on the questions in the pigeonhole, um, and I will pick the ones that are the most popular. Okay, so um, let's try with the first question with three votes. Um, to Michael and Lucilla, what are some of the success cases um, that you could highlight um, for clean energy investments on the end use, whether it is for buildings or industry or transportation? Any case studies that you can um, highlight to us? Because in the audience, we have a lot of the decision makers uh, of corporations, and um, this would be very instructive. Yeah, maybe I can um, I can give a sense of of some of the um, some of the cases that we looked at, some of the examples in the, in the report. Also recognizing you know the end use sector is extremely diverse, um, so there's there's a lot of good cases well beyond this. Um, maybe one I'll try to highlight one in each buildings industry and, and transport. Um, on the building side, we've seen very good progress, um, in particular from in India, uh, with regards to the uptake of of LED lighting. Um, as well as the procurement of, of more efficient air conditioners. Um, a lot of this progress has been underpinned by the, by the creation of a, a super energy services company. Um, so India sort of uniquely has created a, a government-backed entity um, that does a lot of government procurement of, of efficient equipment, is able to offer this more cheaply to the market, combining this with, uh, with various incentives and also performance standards. Um, and in general, we found this to be a very good model um, for helping to bring technologies down the learning curve, but also helping to di disseminate um, a lot of end-use technologies um, in the building sector. We, are, we also know that this, you know, the Super ESCO is, is instrumental in also helping to roll out um, electric vehicle charging stations as well as smart meters. Um, and so the creation of this kind of centralized government procurement effort is a way to help kickstart uh, 
um, efficiency markets where you have the right performance standards in place. Um, on the I mentioned a bit the EV charging aspect. Um, on the transport side, we highlighted a case in the report which was focused on Thailand, and it looked at Thailand's efforts to roll out uh, electric mobility. Um, this had to do with not just in terms of incentivizing the consumers uh, to purchase more electric vehicles, but to focus on the value chain of developing the, the manufacturing capacity, um, giving the necessary incentives to doing this and backing up um, some of the purchase incentives with, with government funds and the availability of, of low cost financing to, uh, um, to purchase such vehicles. And so really trying to take a bit of a value chain approach in, in helping to uh, um, get in investments going in this sector uh, was one that we've seen has developed, uh, has delivered some very good, um, good progress in this nature. Um, and then focusing on the industry side very briefly, um, one of the areas that we highlighted in the report was that some of the moves that uh, different cement companies are trying to make, um, cement companies of course face very challenging decarbonization challenges um, in so far as some of the technologies which are necessary to reach net zero emissions uh, don't exist or are not commercialized. Um, so a number of them have taken steps to increase efficiency, uh, to procure renewables, to electrify um, as a way of diversifying and trying to green their, their energy sources. Um, but we're also seeing some interesting kind of policy uh, responses come up um, to help uh, sort of speed progress in the sector. Uh, one of this is, and again, it's, it's, it's going a bit outside the emerging and developing economies um, because some of the, the more interesting developments here are occurring in advanced economies. Uh, one is this notion of um, some authorities in the US are looking at procurement of low carbon materials, so government procurement of, of low carbon building materials um, as a way to um, help incentivize the uptake of new technologies. Uh, Germany is looking at putting into place um, a contract for difference for emissions reductions um, in, um, in the cement industry, but also other heavy industries, which would help underpin um, the economic case for, for the adoption of, of low carbon hydrogen or ammonia or, or carbon capture and storage. And then we're also seeing some interesting developments by these types of companies in terms of financing. Um, some cement companies have started to issue sustainability link bonds, uh, where basically they're, they're saying that we need to achieve a certain amount of emissions reductions and we're willing to, to tie our cost of capital um, to those emissions reduction, to meeting those emissions reduction goals over time. Thank you, Michael. You mentioned um, in your last point about the use of sustainability link bond in the capital markets. Um, Definitely, we are seeing a lot of uh, interest amongst our customers in using this instrument uh, because it allows them a bit of flexibility in the use of proceeds uh, while uh, really promoting an overall improvement in their uh, greenhouse gas emissions profile and to be on a decarbonization trajectory that is uh, going to be net zero by a certain time uh, in the future. So uh, at DBS, we have been trying that. Uh, in fact, we were the advisor for over a third of the sustainability link bond issuances in Asia ex Japan. Um, so to many of the customers uh, in the audience, uh, we would also encourage you to really um, reach out to your relationship managers if you are interested in exploring this. Okay, let's move on to um, another question, which is quite topical about CCUS, carbon capture, utilization and storage. Uh, yesterday, ExxonMobil during the Energy Week in Singapore announced that they're going to set up a network of CCUS network in Southeast Asia. And um, based on the sound bites, it seems very ambitious. And uh, the headline is that it will allow Southeast Asia to continue its economic growth um, and uh, not be hampered by all these green solutions that we are trying to promote. Um, so I gather that uh, the question um, also ask about the limited pilots that we've seen around the world. Um, in your model uh, at IEA, you do allow for CCUS uh, to varying degrees in order to be net zero by 2050. How realistic do you think this solution is going to be for us to get there? Do you think it will come fast enough? Yeah, so, so CCUS plays an important role in, in the IA projections um, in a couple of different ways. One of those ways is helping to uh, reduce emissions from existing coal power, um, along with uh, retirements and refurbishments. Um, carbon capture is, a, is, a, is one of the three pillars associated with this. CCUS is also uh, quite important in helping to 
decarbonize or reduce emissions um, from some of the heavy industry sectors. And this is also um, part of the IEA projections. Um, but of course, the business case, the commercial case for CCUS is quite complex. And there are a few places in the world where, where right now you can say, you know, CCUS is a, is a commercial investment opportunity. Um, this has to deal with the complexity of, of the value chain, of the physical value chain, but also um, the revenue streams associated with different parts of it. Um, so it's important to have in place um, ways to monetize um, the, the, the CO2 savings, um, as well as ways to fund the, the necessary infrastructure, um, which helps to defray the upfront, upfront costs. We had a section on CCUS in the financing report, um, so we give some more kind of specific examples and also specific ways in which um, public finance can help to uh, be better directed to support CCUS, um, kind of a first order condition and, and one that we see um, uh, from Indonesia, but also other countries is trying to build in CCUS into, into long-term energy strategies and, and planning, which of course is important to give visibility. Um, we note in terms of the types of projects being developed, um, CCUS is, is often part of the equation, but it may not be the only part of the equation. And so thinking about how to develop infrastructure, industrial infrastructure at scale around industrial clusters, around the storage and transport of CCUS, also integrating other technologies um, and a range of companies, I think is important for trying to achieve scale um, for these first projects. Um, we've seen various developments around the world. Many of these are in Europe or in advanced economies trying to advance this, but a few are in emerging and developing economies. And what we see is that so far the approach has been to uh, try to share the infrastructure, try to have um, a joint public and private um, sharing of the different risks in building out that infrastructure, um, as well as having joint ventures between international and, and domestic partners. Um, so the role of large oil companies such as Exxon or others, of course, is very important. They have the balance sheets to be able to take on these types of risks. And so continued progress would need to be made, I think, um, in developing these types of joint ventures in this collaboration um, to bring CC West on the cost curve and also reduce some of the risks associated with commercial development. Great. Let's go back to Pigeon Ho. Let's talk about um, the enabling infrastructure um, to follow on what Michael said. Um, how do you feel that we can attract private finance for key parts of the electricity network? So we, we, we've talked a lot about the generation part. What about the grid and the transmission? Maybe I can take this question. Um, so basically, as, as I think we shown and it's clear now, we see that there's a lot of, and I'll focus sort of on power networks, there's a lot of uh, need for increased investment in transmission and distribution. If there's a big existing gap between the needs and the projected investment, um, we're going to need it because of increased penetration of renewables and demand growth. Uh, and, and currently, the majority of these investments uh, are done by state-owned utilities, um, some of which are unable to do it by their own balance sheet. They do a lot of it. They do use a lot of development finance uh, funds, uh, but and, and and there is some um, private uh, sector participation that has been relatively um, or, or quite success, successful. Sorry, actually in some parts of the world, uh, not as much in Southeast Asia, um, uh, from what I've seen, for example. But we've done actually some analysis for the Southeast Asia region, which is in the IA website. And basically there we show, for example, what are the models uh, that exist for attracting private capital to transmission in particular. And there are various, but sort of among the two biggest ones are long-term concessions. So a concession for 40, 50 years to, for either an entire uh, network within a country or a region within a country. Uh, and or and sometimes that can also become a privatization or a second model, which I think is one of the most interesting ones or more innovative ones, and maybe uh, one that actually we've we've had um, discussions with some of the governments in Southeast Asia as something that is uh, seems interesting. This second model uh, is one where uh, basically a, similar to an IPP model in generation, but where governments still um, have the the 
the planning capacity. They are they are they are in charge of planning capacity and basically and then the expansion of transmission grids. And they bid out a contract to build, own, operate, and eventually transfer a, a line from point A, a sorry, to point B. And this is a contract generally for 20, 25 years. And basically, the private sector does not take demand risk. So whether there's power flowing for this line or not is not really a, a risk that the investor would take. And, but the investor needs to basically, there are two um, key performance indicators in this type of contracts. One is on commissioning, so a certain date and penalties if it's not uh, reached. And second, uh, to ensure a certain degree of line availability, generally very high, around 95, 98%. But as long as the uh, line is available, so basically if the line is well functioning, uh, investors uh, get paid either on an annual basis or on a monthly basis, a payment that is generally um, the majority of it set up front. So it's quite clear, it's much easier to for, for investors to understand what their sort of cash flows through the pro of, throughout the project would be. I think this is an interesting model. It has been quite successful in various South American countries, uh, particularly in Peru, Colombia. Uh, Brazil has been doing this uh, quite a bit too. India has been using a, a very similar model for intra-state uh, transmission lines. And it, it's a model that I think uh, is particularly interesting for, for countries. And I think that's why we get more uh, requests to understand this model, because one, it has sort of low regulatory oversight in the sense like it's very different to what it would require for the regulator if it had, for example, a long-term concession where the regulator needs to on an annual basis, be making sure that um, of all the sort of operation of the entire grid uh, needs to be overseen. Well, in this case, as long as the line is available at the level I mentioned, then uh, uh, it will get paid. Plus, uh, the, the government re remains sort of um, operating the entire grid. So there's a lot of the political um, discussion or political economy that, that sometimes it's, it's, it's easier with this model, uh, precisely for my second point, which is that it's a model that can be piloted. Some countries have started with bidding out one or two lines or a package of lines, and then testing the model, testing whether there's interest from the investors, testing the contracts, and then eventually doing it um, for bigger lines or for, or for a bigger majority. Generally, uh, what, what we've seen is that uh, for this to be successful, or, or to actually attract investment, not only, of course, you need to show that um, some visibility for future um, lines or contracts, but also for the contracts to be relatively big. So the ticket needs to be, that it's, it's not for small lines, it's for bigger lines, and therefore transaction costs uh, are, are not too high. Uh, but it has been quite successful in, in those places, South America in particular, and India, and, and, and it's one that doesn't require as much uh, sort of regulatory oversight, but policy or regulatory changes to start testing it. Um, so that's that's something that I think could be interesting for Southeast Asia. And as I said, we do have an analysis on this uh, at the IEA website. Yeah, I think definitely the developments uh, you've highlighted in Latin America could be replicable in Southeast Asia, uh, especially like you highlighted, we. Um, sometimes have to rely a lot on an enabling regulatory regime for private investments to come in. And actually, that's a big hurdle to cross. So I think um, let me pick on one last question. Uh, and then we will, um, after this, the Q&A session, passing back to we think to wrap up. So the last question I want to um, pick is um, the last one. Um, for a power company with coal power assets, how do I reconcile my country's ambition to only arrive at net zero by 2060 with my own company's decarbonization strategy. I think that really would um, bring a lot of the IEA findings to people's doorstep. I'm running my company, my country in Vietnam, in Indonesia, they're talking about 2060. In fact, in Vietnam, we just read that um, the power development plan is going to double down on coal. What does it mean for my company then? Hmm. It's maybe I can I can kick off and and 
and add some points. But I mean, of course, that's a very interesting and challenging question and opens up a lot of different layers. Um, one of the angles, you know, you could look at this is from the standpoint of, uh, okay, a company has a, a very ambitious, let's say, decarbonization goal or a net zero goal, um, but not all the investments that it's going to make right away are going to deliver low emissions or near zero emissions energy because of the the sort of state of the background system. And one of the analyses that we did in, in the World Energy Outlook, which was just produced uh, two weeks ago, is we looked at some of these, um, let's say, transition investments. So what is the share of investments in the net zero scenario, um, which is neither sort of clearly green nor clearly um, brown, but sort of falls in this middle ground of uh, the investments are contingent upon the underlying power system. So thinking, for example, electrification investments or thinking about investments in the electricity grid in general, um, or those investments are kind of more of a transition nature, so they can provide some near-term emissions reductions, but they're not aligned with a longer-term pathway of net zero emissions. So thinking of things like, like fuel switching from coal to gas uh, boilers or, or using more efficient um, internal combustion engines, for example. And what we actually find is that these investments, these two middle categories, if you put them together, they actually account for more than half of the investments globally in the net zero emissions scenario. Um, and so this middle ground of investments is something which, which often gets overlooked or can be challenging for sustainable finance taxonomies or for company decarbonization strategies to address. And so one of the messages that we put forth is essentially that um, room needs to be made or, or issues, accommodation needs to be made to allow for these types of middle ground of investments because they are important in net zero, um, but to be able to address this in a, in a dynamic manner so that um, the, the world is not continuing to invest in, for example, gas or, or unabated fossil fuels, which don't provide emissions reductions um, in the long term, which are aligned with the, with the net zero strategy. Um, there's another sort of corollary to this and just thinking about the, the power system part and, um, and thinking about the different IEA scenarios. Uh, of course, under the IEA's um, stated policy scenario, under today's policy settings, you still have uh, a large amount of coal power, which is added to the system um, based on the existing plans of different countries, but also what's in the construction pipeline. Now, some of this begins to shift if you look at some of the pledges, the announced pledges that we've seen by various countries around the world uh, to reach net zero emissions. A lot of these pledges are concentrated in advanced economies. You still you have some advanced economies who have committed to a phase out of coal, uh, but this still represents a minority. And you also have um, some countries who are active in overseas financing of China or coal, such as China, um, who have also indicated some shifts in, in their policy. Um, but to reach net zero emissions, we would need to see a, a dramatic ramp up, um, not just in, as I emphasized before, CCUS and, and refurbishment of coal, uh, but also in the retirement of coal power uh, to really unprecedented levels. Um, and so thinking about it from a company standpoint, um, this really has to do with um, engaging the government, but also engaging the financial community, as well as the um, on, air, on ways to be able to to kind of manage this this phase out of coal assets. And um, there's various sort of offers on the table around this, and I think it's to be determined how these play out over time. Um, I know the, the Asian Development Bank is working particularly on, on a blended finance solution to help retire some of the coal-fired capacity in, um, in Southeast Asia. The World Bank is working quite closely with, with local communities um, and, um, and sort of Subnational centers of economic development to help transition the workers and help transition those types of communities and a shift away from coal. Um, but really, there's a multi pronged and sort of long term strategy that would need to be addressed um, to help to make this shift in terms of um, not just scaling up the clean energy investment, which we talked a lot about in this presentation, but also winding down um, the use of coal um, in various uh, forms and, and circumstances which are not aligned uh, with a net zero emissions scenario. Well, Thank you, Michael. And I can swear to the audience that I didn't arrange for Michael to end on transition finance because DBS, of course, is very big on transition. We have our own transition finance taxonomy. Uh, so again, I will invite members of the audience, if they're interested in understanding our transition finance framework, go to our RMs. With this, um, can I pass this back to Wee Sing uh, for his wrap up? Thank you. Um... Michael and Lucilla, we 
really have gained quite a bit from the session. And I do need to apologize to the audience as well. We have gone a bit um, behind time. But let me just quickly close. Some key takeaways for me were are as follows. Financing costs are a big driver of further clean investments. That's one. Uh, the second is private sector involvement needs to increase significantly. Uh, and, and a subtext within that is the cost of equity, especially in the areas that need it most. Uh, for example, Indonesia is shown as um, 11 to 12 percent, which, which I think is reasonable. And therefore, if you want to have a WACC, a WAC that is reasonable, then gearing needs to increase for the WAC to come down. So that's, that's the second point about private sector, about gearing. And, and that's, I think, what something all of us here are really uh, able to do together. Now, what about the availability of funds that's out there? Um, I do agree that it's not so much a lack of capital. We were able to lead a, quite a couple of um, green and sustainability linked bonds out of Indonesia, out of Singapore. Um, for the likes of uh, Star Energy, which is one of the largest uh, investment grade um, geothermal bonds out there. That was 1.1 billion. We did the same for Vina, which is one of the Singapore headquartered uh, pure play renewable uh, energy company. As well as for Samcorp, we did the green bond as well as the sustainability linked bond. All very well oversubscribed. So the availability of, availability of funds is there. Um, the, real, the thing to solve for is obviously these were all fairly blue chip names, right? Um, even the Indonesian uh, Star Energy bond was uh, investment grade. So those are fairly blue chip. And it shows that availability of funds is there. The thing to solve for, I feel, is bankability, as we all know already, and scale, especially for renewables. The renewable uh, projects are obviously... Uh, much smaller, uh, with the exception of offshore wind, much smaller than the conventional power projects we use to see. So to really mobilize that dollar, the thing to solve for is not only to make it bankable, but to scale it. And I think the time bar to accelerate these investments and to solve for these scale issues is 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 um, is soon, because um, debt costs currently still remain low, and debt that has been a key enabler of a lot of the investments we have seen in terms of funds being able to clear their hurdles, largely because the overall WAC with a high gearing of low cost debt is able to help them achieve. Uh, so there is a window for us to really accelerate this and really that, that's, a, that's one key takeaway for me. Um, the second has been our journey ourselves as a bank. We in a sense, the relatively easy part was to say what we won't finance anymore. We have uh, committed to uh, cease financing of new coal-fired power plants since 2019. And um, we have also committed to um, really getting to net zero operational carbon by 2022. But I think that the message we really want to leave is that that's the relatively easier part, what not to do. But what we have committed to do is also to guide these very clients who have been affected through these pivots uh, toward a diversification strategy and working together with them for and solve for the pathways to transit to. And, and already we're seeing a lot of life cases in our pipeline as this um, net zero imperative becomes more urgent. So really quite happy to conclude that Achieving a cleaner future will really need all hands on deck, the whole ecosystem. And that's why we wanted to play uh, a meaningful part. And this webinar is one of those uh, small bits in the whole jigsaw to really co-create together, to really catalyze industry thinking. And I hope you have gained deeper insights into what lies ahead of the journey of transition toward a climate-aligned future. So do give us your feedback through our post-event survey. But what I really want to leave with you is there is a next session planned on 24th November with the IEA. And this round, they will be sharing findings from their report on net zero emissions. So do look out for our invite. And I thank you. I thank uh, Michael and Lucilla. And stay safe.
Thank you, everyone.